we have learnt about electronic energy states and we know how knowing the electron configuration including the uh, spin states we can talk about electronic energy states. And uh, we are now going to talk about the transitions between these states. We are already familiar with n pi star and pi pi star transitions and uh, we had closed the discussion in the previous module saying that not all transitions are going to take place. Some transitions are more probable, some transitions are less probable. Uh, according to that the intensity of transition is defined. In that connection we are going to study Lambert Beer's law and then we will talk about different kinds of spectra that one could get depending on the uh, bond length of the ground and excited electronic states. And uh, then we will talk about some other kinds of transitions. But before that uh, let us have a look at an actual spectrum uh, reported in scientific literature. This here is an absorption spectrum of benzene dissolved in cyclohexane. A, an aromatic compound dissolved in a non aromatic organic solvent. So, since it is benzene you might as well understand that these transitions that you see they are pi pi star transition because benzene does not have a nitrogen atom or oxygen atom or any such thing. So, two things to note here are first of all what is the y axis what is the x axis? x axis here is wavelength x axis in a spectrum has to be something that is related to energy. It is conventional to use wavelength because uh, most of the measurements in the ultraviolet visible region is performed by using dispersive uh, gratings or spectrometer uh, detector kind of combinations. And this dispersive gratings work on the principle of as we know uh, Bragg's diffraction law. So, there uh, the diffraction is defined in terms of wavelength. But uh, it is not very difficult to convert from wavelength to energy. When we do that uh, we have to do some correction called Jacobian correction to this but that is a different story altogether. The second thing is what is the y axis actually three things that we have to discuss. The y axis is molar extinction coefficient in centimeter inverse per molar we are going to learn about this. The third aspect is look at the spectrum the spectrum is highly structured why is the spectrum highly structured and are all spectra highly structured? By the time we are done today we will know the answer to these questions. But first let us remember what we learnt in the last module there are selection rules spin selection rule which is more stringent requires that there cannot be any transition between a singlet and a triplet state and orbital selection rule which is less stringent uh, is based on symmetry of spatial wave functions spin selection rule can uh, break down because of spin orbit coupling orbital selection rule can break down by vibronic coupling. So, all those bands that you saw a little while ago they are actually vibronic bands they involve not only electronic levels but also vibrational level we will come to that. But first before that since we are talking about transitions that are more probable and that are less probable we need some means by which we should be experimentally able to determine which transition is more probable which transition is less probable. An experimental parameter that tells us about the probability of transition and this is obtained in the form of Lambert Beer's law. If you remember the y axis of the spectrum that we just saw that is what it is. Well Lambert and Beer uh, independently uh, propose something and then you combine them to get the law. Let us say uh, this rectangle is a sample the length of the sample along the direction of propagation of light is L intensity of light impinging on the sample is I0 and intensity of light transmitted from the sample is IT right. So, what happens as the uh, shading of the arrow also shows is that uh, as light gets absorbed by the molecules that are there in the sample it uh, loses intensity some of the light is absorbed right. So, it does not go out. So, intensity would decrease or an extinction to some extent would take place. So, to find out the relationship between I0 and IT what Lambert and Pierre separately did was uh, they considered a thickness DL in the sample in the direction of propagation of light and uh, the intensity of light impinging on this uh, small uh, element let us say that is I 
an intensity of a light that emerges from this element let us say that is I minus di that means this uh, narrow strip has caused a decrease in intensity by an amount di. So, uh, Lambert and Beers two scientists figured out that this minus di is proportional to three things the intensity of light that impinges on that element concentration of the sample. So, how many molecules uh, the light would have to pass through and dl the thickness of this element. So, it is a proportionality can be written very easily in terms of a uh, an equation. But before that uh, one thing that we should say is that in this treatment C is always written as molar concentration and L is always written in terms of centimeter that is what gives us the unit. So, minus d i then is kappa into i into c into d l where kappa is the constant of proportionality not very difficult to figure out what has to be done minus d i by i equal to k multiplied by c d l all we have to do now is integrate both sides left side has to be integrated from i 0 to i t right side has to be integrated from 0 to l. So, this is what we need to do and when we do that right side is very simple integral of d l between limit 0 and l is just l left hand side is also simple d i by i integrated is going to be a natural logarithm of i and the limits are i 0 and i t anyway. So, we get l n i 0 by i t is equal to kappa c l and since we are more comfortable working with uh, logarithm to the base 10 uh, it is not difficult to convert l n to log base 10 you have to just multiply by a constant and do that you get log i 0 by i t remember this log is base 10 is equal to epsilon c l this constant kappa is multiplied by a number and I will not uh, say explicitly what the number is I think all students of this course should know what it is. If you do not better check better uh, remember this value all right. So, log i 0 by i t is equal to epsilon c l c is concentration l is length of the sample. What is there on the left hand side log i 0 by i t that essentially tells us how much of the incident light has been absorbed this is called absorbance it is an extrinsic quantity depends on c and l also. And what is epsilon? Since epsilon is multiplied by c and l the uh, parameters that have got to do with how much of sample there is, how much of sample the photons have to pass through epsilon is actually an intrinsic quantity. It is uh, something that gives us an idea about how probable the transition is. So, this is called molar extinction coefficient or molar absorption coefficient. I always called it molar extinction coefficient, but few years ago I had a student who told me unequivocally that molar extinction coefficient is apparently outdated and I have to call it molar absorption coefficient. I like the term extinction because look at this arrow it is actually light is getting extinguished to some extent, but anyway molar absorption coefficient is the more modern term both work. So, molar extinction or molar absorption coefficient tells us about probability of transition an experimental parameter that tells us how probable the transition is. In fact, uh, with a little bit of theory one can find a relationship between this experimentally observed quantity and the uh, theoretically calculated probability of transition. Uh, this is worked out in uh, many standard textbooks uh, Barrow is what I studied, but then Barrow is out of print. So, you could study this from I think Macquarie and Simon's book and maybe even Atkins physical chemistry book. By the way I did not mention uh, any textbook so far you can study all this from Atkins by and large uh, people who are interested in a little more you can study uh, Banwell's molecular spectroscopy book. Those who are interested in a lot more I recommend molecular spectroscopy by Jack D. Greville, but that book is way beyond the scope of the current course right. Let us come back to this we have this equation absorbance is equal to epsilon c l. So, if I measure absorbance at different concentrations then what happens absorbance should increase within a certain uh, range. So, if I plot absorbance against concentration if I know concentration then the slope should give me epsilon it is as simple as that. Now, uh, high absorbance what does that mean 
high absorbance means that very little light will emerge from the sample. So, the sample is nearing opacity. I leave it to you to work out what is the percentage of light that is transmitted I t divided by I 0 multiplied by 100 when absorbance is 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1 and 10. Please work this out and uh, I think you will understand why I would like you to do this. Absorbance tells us how opaque or how transparent the sample is for that particular wavelength. What are the factors that epsilon depend upon? Definitely it depends upon the wavelength. That is why in the spectrum that I showed you the plot was actually epsilon against wavelength or uh, uh, energy because some transitions are more probable, some transitions are less probable. And if you remember the unit that was written in the spectrum, the unit was I think they had written centimeter inverse per molar, I have written per molar per centimeter inverse. Very easy to work out from this expression. Left hand side absorbance has no unit, please remember absorbance has no unit. It is a logarithm of a ratio, and there is no way it can have any unit. Right hand side C has a unit, L has a unit, so epsilon also has a unit per molar per centimeter. Okay. So, this is Lambert Beer's law. Epsilon tells us probability of transition. Now, if we recall the kind of transitions that we know already, there are transitions that are uh, spin forbidden, but allowed a little bit by uh, spin orbit coupling. You have there are transitions that are maybe spin allowed, but or vitally forbidden allowed a little bit by fibronic coupling. So, uh, and some there are some transitions that are completely allowed spin allowed as well as orbitally allowed. The difference in the probability among these shows up very nicely in the comparative values of the epsilons, the molar absorption coefficients and this table summarizes it quite nicely. For fully allowed transitions spin allowed as well as orbitally allowed the uh, molar extinction coefficient in per molar per centimeter uh, ranges from 10 to the power 3 3 to the power 5, I have taken log to the base 10 here that is why it is 3 to 5. For spin allowed transitions which are orbitally forbidden they come next in line and epsilon ranges from 10 to the power 0 uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 that kind of thing to 10 to the power 3, 1000, 2000, 3, so on and so forth. For orbitally allowed but spin forbidden transition as I said if you remember spin selection rule is more stringent. So, epsilon ranges from 10 to the power minus 5 to 10 to the power 0 really really small transitions less intense transitions. And I uh, will not discuss this in detail, but this here is a collection of spectra of different aromatic hydrocarbons benzene, phenanthrene and naphthysene. I leave it to you to figure out which ones are uh, fully allowed which ones which of these transitions are spin allowed, which ones of these transitions are orbitally allowed. But what we are going to discuss today in the remaining 10 12 minutes is that why is it that they are all structured. Even in the benzene spectrum that I showed you earlier if you remember they are all structured. So, why is it that they are structured? Why are the spectra structured? They are structured because see we were talking about this, this is let us say the ground state S0 and this is let us say S1 the excited state, these are electronic levels. But electronic levels are associated with vibrational sub levels and these levels are characterized by vibrational quantum numbers that range from 0, 1, 2 so on and so forth and even S1 they are characterized by vibrational levels. It is conventional to denote those quantum numbers by V dash equal to I will write 0 dash, 1 dash, 2 dash, 3 dash. Now, the difference between vibrational levels is high enough. So, only the 0th vibrational level of S0 is populated at uh, room temperature. So, any upward transition has to originate in V equal to 0. But then for vibronically allowed transitions, it is not as if only the 0 0 dashed transition will take place 0 1 dashed 0 2 dashed 0 3 dashed 
all these transitions can take place with different probabilities. Uh, sorry about my poor artistic skills, please remember that these vertical lines are all straight lines, they are uh, not really the curvy lines that I have drawn. But the point is for a given vibrational, uh, for a given uh, electronic energy gap, there can be multiple transitions involving the vibrational uh, sub levels of the higher electronic state. And that is what we are going to dwell upon a little bit and that is what gives the uh, structure to this absorption spectrum. So, you can think that this is S02 uh, okay, in which direction is energy increasing uh, from left to right wavelength increases. So, energy increases from right to left. So, this one is S02 to, to uh, well V equal to 0 to V dash equal to 1 dash transition, this is V equal to 0 to V dash equal to 2 to 3 dash, 4 dash and so on and so forth. And as you see that these vibronic transitions are not all equally probable. Also there are two kinds of spectra in for naphthacene you see the 0 0 dash transition seems to be the most intense whereas for benzene some other transition seems to be most intense why is that so? That is what we will learn in the next 10 minutes or so. But before that uh, one more thing that uh, we want to talk about is solvent effect and how do you know which transition is what? First of all we have discussed already that n pi star transitions are less probable. Yeah. Uh, because they are orbitally forbidden. So, uh, if you in a molecule you have a less probable transition in a little lower energy region, then you can think that it is n pi star transition compared to pi pi star transitions which are expected to be stronger and in higher energy smaller wavelength region. What happens if I add acid? If I add acid the lone pairs would get engaged with the proton. So, n pi star transition would uh, gradually vanish if you add enough acid. It would decrease with increasing acid amount, finally it would vanish. For polar solvents, n pi star transitions show blue shift or hypsochromic shift. That means they shift to higher energies. Blue and red are relative terms. Pi pi star transitions show very small bathochromic or red shift. Why is that so? Because when you have these uh, polar solvents, the uh, energy levels actually get stabilized to different extents. The pi level gets stabilized to some extent, n level gets stabilized to a much greater extent. Because in non-bonding orbitals, you have this electron pairs that are more strongly directed. So, it is easier for solvent to uh, lower their energies. Pi star also gets stabilized to an extent that is greater than that of pi because it is more delocalized, but not as much as that of n. Uh, all these stabilizations are uh, they are not to scale, they are grossly overemphasized. So, what I should what would I get in a polar solvent? Let us say in left hand side this is a situation in non-polar solvent, right hand side situation is a in a polar solvent. This n pi star gap actually is more than the n pi star gap in non-polar solvent. That is why n pi star transition shows a hip hypsochromic or blue shift, whereas pi pi star transition can show a little small uh, bathochromic shift because pi star is stabilized to a greater extent than pi. Another kind of transitions that take place very often are charge transfer transitions. What is that? Suppose you have a donor and an acceptor, uh, something that likes to donate electron, something that likes to accept electron. Let us say you have an organic molecule, uh, some kind of a coumarin and let us say you have aniline. Aniline uh, is a good donor and uh, coumarin is a good electron acceptor. So, when they are close together of course, uh, they have to be in close proximity. So, we will see how they are brought in close proximity. Then if you shine with the right amount of light, right wavelength of light, then there can be a transition from the donor to the acceptor. So, these transitions always occur in low energies because they take place only when the energy gap is not very large. They are broad and structureless. Why are they broad and structureless? Well, uh, see this donor acceptor energy levels are two different systems relative to each other they can have a big spread that is why they are broad and they are structureless because this is unbound states. So, uh, there is no really vibration that holds them together except for some very uh, loose vibration. Uh, involving the donor and acceptor moieties. So, they are by and large structureless. They show strong sol solvent effect because there is a charge transfer, charge separation. 
So, naturally when you have a polar solvent it is going to stabilize charge transfer states to a very large extent. And now how do you get the donor and acceptor together? One easy way of doing it is that if the solvent itself is either donor or acceptor then the solute is surrounded by the donor or acceptor or whatever it might be then you can have charge transfer with the solvent. Otherwise if both solutes uh, are involved in charge transfer then their concentration would better be very large otherwise it does not happen. The third option is a donor and an acceptor that are uh, bonded together that is when charge transfer can happen very easily. In metal ion complexes the charge transfer often involves the ligand as well as the metal depending on the direction of charge transfer it is called metal to ligand charge transfer or ligand to metal charge transfer about which you might study a little more in your discussion of inorganic chemistry. But before leaving this slide this here is a schematic uh, representation of the absorption spectra. Uh, let us say this is the absorption spectrum of acceptor, this is the absorption spectrum of donor. Charge transfer band would appear only when donor and acceptor are present together in sufficiently high concentration or covalently bonded together. As you see it appears at longer wavelength that is smaller wave uh, smaller uh, energy, it is broad and it is structureless. These are the characteristics of charge transfer bands. So, we stop here and in the next module we will talk about this time not uh, structureless but structured absorption.